like to welcome everybody in this morning. Welcome to Eagle Church. Let's stand to our feet.
and Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. I'll sing that again. My hope is real.
Amen. Lord, you are worthy. And today, we bow before a worthy God, a God who's worthy of our lives, who's worthy of our vocations. In a world demanding uh, respect, you demand, uh, you don't demand it. You're just worthy of it. And you give us freedom to love you. To give you something far more than respect, God. We love you. I pray today you would teach us what it means and what it looks like to love you, not just here on Sunday and not um, not just when we pray, not just when we read our Bible, but when we do everything in life, God. Let our lives be worship to a God who is worthy. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to everybody in this room. Welcome to all those joining us online. I've looked forward to this Sunday for a couple of months now. Some of you are looking around going, I had no idea that you cleaned up so well during the week. So we declared this day where your work closed to church day. So if you're new with us, we just kind of want to bring you into the fold and the series of what we're about today. And it'll make a little more sense uh, towards the end of the message here today. But thanks to everyone who participated. How about give it up for our worship leader and his wife, the worship leading vacuum cleaning stay-at-home mom. Hunter and Jen and the crew, but thanks for everyone who's being a part of this day where we've talked about over the last month a theology of work and calling, and you've heard me say, if we can get this internalized deep in the inmost places of our lives, it's like discovering a new continent. We've been calling it God and Mondays. What does our worship on Sunday have to do with our work on Monday and following. So, on your way in the door this morning, you should have received a note sheet. I've got the ushers queued up to come down the aisle. Today, it'd be helpful, even you non-note sheet folks, if you could have a note sheet at least close to you, and I'd like to invite you, permission given now, to flip it over. Raise your hand if you need one, okay? If you don't, you or the person next to you doesn't have a note sheet, stick your hand up. Ushers will come and get you one. So, permission to flip it over on the back side of the note sheet, scan down the list of vocations that are listed there. We've got groupings of vocations, 15 of them. There's a hand over here. You can see it over here. I think Clarence. Good to see you, Clarence. Um, so you, I would like you... Now listen, I know that many of you in here probably land in a couple of different camps. That's fine. Just choose one that you're most aligned with. And if you're not sure on any of them, I put a nice generic final category. Do you see it? We're going to bless the others today, all right? If you just don't know where you land, but I'm guessing a good chunk of you. So later on in the message, as we transition to time of commissioning, I'm going to ask you to stand in representation of which group you find yourself in. And some of you are saying, well, I'm retired. I no longer work. You're in the transitions group. You see that? Or you're in between work. So find yourself in there as I get going here in the message this morning. So, I've loved to work for as long as I can remember. Now, my mom, mom, I love you. She's usually joining us from Central Iowa on home. Mom's like, that's not true, because she used to leave a chores list on the counter. And I know, mom, Brad and I, we weren't really feeling it, especially during those you know, teenage years where you're just convinced you know everything. Like, you're right. You're 16, 17, and you just got the world by the tail, and you know everything. The chores list, a 16-year-old boy's not feeling. So, but I just want you to know, Mom, I always love to work. I just wasn't particularly drawn to the kind of work you put on the <laughs> chores list. But I love going to work. And I remember my grandpa would take me out into the field, and he would pull out the chainsaw and the wood splitter, and he'd pull my brother and I aside, and he'd say, Son, here's what you need to remember. Honest day's work honest day's pay. Let's get after it. And man, my grandpa knew how to work. He owned his own company, owned his own carpet shop, and he found a couple of good teenage boys like my brother and I, and we would spend our summers ripping out carpet from college dormitories, 110 degrees outside. And and guess who had the third floor duties? It was the young guys, right? Because that's what you do when you're the young guy. Hey, you take the third floor room, start ripping it out. Have a great time. And so somewhere along the way in enjoying work, I enjoyed just kind of putting my hands to something and getting something done. Of course, enjoyed a little paycheck 
at the end of the week, but somewhere along the way, like in school, I had a hard time, students, you feeling this? Like when I was early on in school, I just thought it was a spectacular waste of time. I don't know if any other students feeling me right now, but if you are, let me encourage you. Somewhere like junior, senior year of high school, I pieced together that giving my best in the classroom was really important to whatever I was going to be doing next. Now, I know mom and dad had raised me much earlier in that to connect those dots, but it, you know, not the quickest learner, okay, slow to connect the dots. I, oh, you know what? Giving my best at school, that's going to be really important for college and whatever life beyond that. So it started kind of clicking latter part of high school into college. I got to Iowa State University, go clones. Any clones in the house? Come on, go clones. Sweet 16 today, baby. All right, let's go. Okay, so <laughs> Iowa State University, 26,000 students during finals week. You can ask my wife this. She was also an Iowa Stater. She would say, hey, see you later, hon. She'd bow out 10, 11 o'clock at night, and I would close the library down during finals week at 2 a.m. There aren't a lot of college students leaving the library at 2 a.m. Let me just say, you could count them on like this hands right here. And we had a little club. We were like the 2 a.m. club. There's 26,000 students at Iowa State. There's about 10 of us at 2 a.m. leaving. I was in that group of 10. And then I started to work at Eli Lilly. And you heard me say a few weeks ago, like within the first three or four months, I remember my project leader said, hey, I need a volunteer who will stay here overnight and kind of babysit this project through the night. I'll do it. I'm sleeping on my cubicle floor back in the days when you wore a full suit to Lily. I'm sleeping there with like my trench coat covered up and some form of a pillow. And I remember Kendra saying, honey, what are you doing? I said, I'm staying here all night. She said, you're doing what? I said, they, they asked for a volunteer. And she's, you volunteered? You're salaried. You're not even hourly. Hourly. <laughs> But that's me. Anybody else in this? Like, I just love to work. And when there was an opportunity to get after, I just want to put my hands to the plow and accomplish something and produce something. And then when I went into, I left Lily and came to work here at the church full time, I, I poured it in all this drivenness and this strong work ethic. And it was me who was kind of working in pastoral work all week long and then nights and weekends trying to get my master's degree and trying to get ordination. And it was 80, 90, 100 hours a week. That's just the way it was. And a work ethic is a great thing to have. I'm so grateful. Mom, I'm so grateful for you and dad and grandma and grandpa. I'm grateful for mentors and teachers and other leaders in my life who encouraged me that when I put my hands to the plow to give it everything I've got in the spirit of Colossians 3, work at it with all your heart. Work ethic is a really good thing. Because as we talked about a few weeks ago, rest only gets its definition from work. Come on now, somebody needs to feel this, right? No point resting if there's no working. You're resting from work. Somebody's been parenting in this space. I know that right now. Some, of, some people, we got, we've got generations of folks kind of PhD in rest, feeling that. We got to move it a little over into the work category and help us understand that our resting God six days work, produce, accomplish, create. Then he rested from all that he was working from. Work ethic is a great thing. And I've tried to spend the last month lifting that up, putting a, a biblical foundation under that from Genesis 1, and then looking at the brokenness of it from Genesis 3, and look at the spirit of it from Colossians 3, that work is a good thing, and getting after it's a good thing. Well, I want to take a few minutes today and talk about, here, here's the cautionary moment. There's a shadow side to a great work ethic. Here's the shadow side. Here's a journey I've been on for, for many years and maybe somebody else is feeling it today. The shadow side to getting after it and enjoying work and loving to produce and accomplish things, the shadow side is this. Work can move from a good thing to an ultimate thing. And when something moves from a good thing to an ultimate thing, the Bible calls that an idol. And work starts to occupy a space in our lives and in our heart and our priorities that God never intended. And so what I want to look at today is I want to look at what I'm calling identity integrity. Because here's the journey I've been on with this, that 
with the desire to work and the love to produce and accomplish, I can look too intently and too purposefully towards my work to try to harvest something out of it that God never intended it to be. Work has its rightful place. It's a good thing, but it can't be an ultimate thing. Working and producing cannot be the basis of our identity, and that's why I put in your notes why I kind of want to frame today's message around what I'm calling identity, integrity, and we're going to look at a story from the life of Jesus to help us frame this. In your notes, I put it this way. Identity, integrity is this. Knowing who I am and who I'm not frees me from trying to extract out of work more than God intended. Are you tracking with me? If you're tracking with me, say amen. Okay, so look, here's Pete Scazzaro. He wrote this, the vast majority of us go to our graves without knowing who we are. We unconsciously live someone else's life, or at least someone else's expectations of us. This does violence to ourselves, our relationship with God, and ultimately others. And so here's the journey. We've got to look at how do we build an integrity that I'm going to call from heaven as opposed to from earth. Because identity, integrity is grounded in heaven and not from the things of this world. And that's modeled for us, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 and following here. You follow along on the screen or on your notes. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Now, this is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle, two different Johns. This is the one doing the baptizing. Verse 14, John tried to deter him, rightly so. You and I probably would have done the same thing, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Now, you got, you got to feel John the Baptist here. I mean, think, he's been doing all this baptizing, all these people, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus walks up, says, I need to be baptized being. And John's thinking, how do I do this? In the name of the Father, you, <laughs> Holy Spirit, uh, what? right? I mean, you got to feel John. He's like, no, this is, no you, you do the baptizing. I'm baptizing everyone in, in your name. So John's like, no, this isn't adding up. And listen to what Jesus replies, verse 15. Let it be so now, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. That's Bible speak for obey on the first request, all right? Jesus is saying, hey, look, I understand you guys struggle with it. Do what, I, do what I told you to do. And then verse 16, or he says, then John consented. Yeah, generally when Jesus asks for something to be done, generally it gets done right there. John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, follow this, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. What an amazing moment. And church, have we not had some amazing baptism services around here? Just a few weeks ago, we had some. And our good friend Hal, Hal, I see you today here, our newly baptized Hal. Wasn't it amazing, 86 years old, he gets in the waters of baptism. Who didn't love when Hal stood on the top step of the baptism tank and just stood there and soaked it all in? Now, Hal, I have to confess, when you got in the waters, I got a little nervous because you enjoyed the water so much. He sunk down in the waters and he said, oh, this is warm. And I don't know if you noticed, we're worshiping and singing, but Hal was floating in the water. Remember that, Hal? You just like, man, this feels good. He's just floating. I said, Hal, we got to like sit your bottom down there. Hal, we got to get you baptized. Oh, this feels good. He's just laying back, just enjoying it. I think he was looking for the heavens to open and the doves to descend. We've had some amazing baptism moments, have we not? And how inspiring it is to see someone at house stage of life to say, hey, I want to stand before my church family. I want to publicly say I'm all in with Jesus. He's everything for me. And there's nothing like seeing the face of another under the waters of baptism. And Bob and others who are around the tank, you remember seeing Hal's face under the waters like how it was so beautiful, as well as Linda's and everyone else who was baptized that day. Just seeing you release and embrace what Jesus has for you. Now, here's what I want you to track. I want you to see that in Jesus' life and in his ministry now, he's 30 years old. The Gospels primarily record 95% of the four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four biographies of Jesus' life. 95% of the content of those biographies is from age 30 to age 33 of Jesus' life. We're not given much of a window from zero to 30, other than he was raised in a carpenter's household, his parents lost him one day, super helpful for all of us as parents who lose our kids, and say, it happened to Jesus' parents too, you know? 
Recently, I was like at the dinner table, and we were talking about, hey, great time we had at Disney World like years and years ago. I said, Kaylin, what was your favorite memory at Disney World? She says, oh, I remember when you and mom lost me. I'm like, that's what you remember? Yeah, you remember Bugs Life Playground? I was standing there like crying my eyes out, and I didn't think you and mom were coming for me. Ah, that happened to Jesus' parents too. You're getting little windows into that, right? He's a carpenter's son. He's growing up. But you're not... He's probably just kind of making footstools and wood benches and hanging out with Joseph. And then at age 30, here's the first kind of entrance into his public ministry. I want you to see that this baptism moment is an affirmation of Jesus' identity. It's the Father saying to the Son, I love you, I see you, I know you, I'm well pleased with you. Before, hear this, before you're about to do a bunch of work for the glory of my name. Whoa, don't miss this, church. This is significant. Because here's been my journey. Sometimes I can get on the treadmill of working and producing and accomplishing and creating to try to gain my identity and approval from God, to try to find who I really am. And here's the Father saying to the Son, I love you, I see you, I know you. Here's your identity integrity. Before you do any teaching and preaching and healing and confronting the religious leaders, eventually going to the cross and Calvary and the empty tomb before you do all of that good work in my name. Here's what I want you to know. Your identity is firm and secure from heaven in me. I'm your father. You're my son. I see you. I know you. I love you. I'm well pleased with you. Do you see this, church? This, then, is the grounds for Jesus to step into his work with freedom to not look to work, to doing things for God, to be something that he never intended it to be, the grounds of who he is as a person. And so that's why I put in your notes, I'm calling it this identity integrity. Tim Keller, he put it this way in the quote in your notes, many people are trying to get a sense of self through productivity and success, but that burns them out. For others, the motivation is to bring home a paycheck so they can enjoy real life. But that makes work into a pointless grind. These motivations are what we could call the work beneath the work. That's what we're working on today, church. The work beneath the work. Identity, integrity. We're going underneath the surface. We're doing some digging. And we're looking at the life of Jesus and we're going to say, how did Jesus gain his identity, integrity from heaven and then it gave him freedom to live out his work on earth? Versus the journey for me, and perhaps for you has been, I sometimes look to try to gain my identity from the things of this world and trying to make work into something, push it into category from a good thing to an ultimate thing. Because there's a fine line, is there not, from like working with all your heart to deriving a sense of self from what you're doing with your work. There's a fine line there. A.W. Tozer said the difference between the absolutely holy and the horribly demonic is about this much. That's this. Like, there's a fine line between giving it my best and building an identity from achievement and accomplishment. There's a fine line between a good thing and an ultimate thing. That's what we're looking at here. So identity, integrity, the work beneath the work, Jesus models, Matthew 3. It's this, identity from heaven. God knows me, God loves me, God's for me, I am a child of God. That's his identity, integrity. No coincidence, by the way, in your Gospels, Matthew 3, the next verse in chapter 4, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus out into the wilderness to tempt him for 40 days. He didn't get much time post-baptism, and he's 40 days of an intense spiritual battle with Satan, which parentheses, by the way, those of you who are baptized, this is why perhaps the first couple of months after your baptism, you feel the spiritual intensity of the battle more strongly than you've ever felt before. This is what it looks like. When you put a stake in the ground, it's on. Remember, resistance indicates progress. You're pushing in, you're going to get pushed back. Jesus got this, heavens open, doves descending, voice from the Father, I love you, I'm with you, I'm for you, I'm well pleased with you. Gets up, spirit leads him in the desert for 40 days. It's on now. His work is moving, but his work is coming from a base of he's already established who he is and whose he is. Do you see that? Versus What I put in your notes, some of my journey, perhaps yours as well, is sometimes I look to things like from the earth to gain my identity, like performance. I am what I do. We can get into this treadmill to like base who I I am what I, I do. One German philosopher labeled our generation the achievement society, calling modern Westerners, listen to this quote, entrepreneurs of themselves. 
And he said the symptoms of a generation who's an entrepreneur of themselves is just all about achievement is depression, feelings of inferiority, insecurity, fear of failure. Hallmarks of a late modern Western achievement society. That's getting on the performance treadmill and trying to harvest out of work something God never intended it to be. I am not what I, you're not what you do, but that's why I try to, you try to extract it from earth. Or maybe it's not performance for you, maybe it's possessions. I am what I have. This treadmill program works like this. Work more, buy more, repeat. Work more, buy more, repeat. The whole North American marketing infrastructure is built on this. Extracting an identity from possessing. I am what I have. It's more, new, better, different. That's the program. More, new, better, different. So it may not be performance for you. I am what I do. Or possessions, I am what I have. Maybe for you, it's trying to extract an identity out of popularity. I am what others say about me. You know, you can get into this you can get into this place where you're projecting kind of a persona, an airbrush version of you that's different from the real you. And when that gap gets too wide, it's an exhausting way to live when you're putting out for the public eye to see an airbrushed or Instagram filtered version or TikTok version of you. Like, but the real you is back here. You, you tracking with me? And our social media age has really amplified this because it doesn't take too long to scroll, scroll through Instagram and to find someone with like a better family and better, um, better looking family and better kids and better spouse and better job and six pack abs and all these things. You just scroll through and there's somebody with better, new, different than, than you. But the real, the real question is who are you when you're not the center of attention have put on 10 pounds and lost the cool factor? That's the real question. And some of you are like, well, I never had the cool factor to lose it. Fair enough. <laughs> but who are you then? Because you try to look to the things of this world, either in, right, performance, I am what I do, popu- or, or possessions, I am what I have, popularity, I am what others say about me. And if you don't do, hear this, if you don't do the work beneath the work, you're going to be pulled to try to extract out of the things of this earth, specifically with work, you're going to try to turn to work, to career, to achievement, to accomplishment, to bring something for you that God never intended. And the freedom that Jesus models is actually, I have the Father's love and approval and affirmation before I actually get about doing anything in His name. I work from a base of identity, not to find my identity. This is the key. And I think this is how we keep work from moving from a good thing to an ultimate thing. And so this church, this is why I spent like, I spent so many years like in therapy and counseling and meeting with mentors. This has been like the work beneath the work in my life for decades. Just trying to help kind of harness in what is a great thing, which is a work ethic. And I love to work and and enjoy what I'm doing, and like, it's great to accomplish that, but man, it's just so, I can just get so outcome-driven, and kind of get yoked to outcomes, and to producing things, and achievement-oriented, to the point where, here's what happens when I get kind of yoked to outcomes, then when things in the work world are going well, kind of going like I want them to go, I'm kind of, I think I'm a pretty enjoyable person to be around, you can ask my wife and coworkers that for sure, but I think so, but when things at work and they're not going well, when the stuff is just going the wrong direction, I can just get into a cycle where I'm super hard on myself and I'm just, I'm not a very fun person to be around. I just kind of go on this emotional, relational roller coaster if I get yoked up to achievement and try to find my identity in my work and try to be tied up with outcomes. There's just this journey and it just is relentless. And that's why I've had talk to therapists and talk to counselors and talk to mentors and meet with folks who will pray and open up my heart and say, you got to help me work through this. And thankfully, some of you in this room have been a, a big part of that for me. Certainly, still got plenty of work to do, but I, I can say to you, I feel like 28, 29, 30 years into this working life, I feel like I'm a little farther down the road of what Jesus is saying. You're supposed to have your identity rooted in heaven and not the things of this earth. And I feel what I think our New Testament example of this, I think is the Apostle Peter. I think this is Peter's journey when you follow his life. 
You know Peter? You know, he, he had a great fishing business. You know Peter knew how to work. Are, anybody watching the Chosen series? How many of you have been in the Chosen? If you haven't started watching the Chosen series, you need to Google it, download the app, and start in. It's so well done, but I think that probably the best part of the series for me personally is the window into the humanity of the disciples, the everyday ordinariness of the disciples' lives, and do a great job, I think, profiling Peter, especially in the early part of the series. Peter had a great fishing business. He was a hard worker, a family man, marriage, kids, business, busy guy. Jesus comes to him and says, hey, come follow me. Leaves the net, start following Jesus. It's Peter who's like, he just takes all that work ethic that he put in the fishing business, he just put it all in with Jesus, right? And he's the one who says to Jesus, even if everyone else doesn't leave you, I never will. Remember Peter? He declares, never will hill. That's Peter. But it's also Peter, Jesus confronted and said, hey, get behind me, Satan. That's not a good day, right? If Jesus had to say to him, get behind me, Satan, I mean, I know you had maybe a rough week, probably didn't have it that rough. Satan, really? I mean, Peter, he just was, he, because he was so zealous and he had, I think, such a great work ethic, I think it was so driven to accomplish and achieve for Jesus and for God's glory that I think it was getting a little mixed up inside of there. So then he went from being so zealous for Jesus, right? And then Christ is arrested, and he's just looking for some people to stay on the Jesus train. Hey, stay on Team Jesus. It's going to get really hard. And Peter's like, you know, they come and confront him and say, hey, Peter, do you know that guy who just got arrested, Jesus? Uh, I don't know. Denies him not once, not twice, three times, rooster crows. And he's like, oh my gosh, what did I do? It's Peter. Do you see it? It's like, Jesus, work beneath the work. Do you see this? The work beneath the work of Peter's life is getting, you know, it's getting some real work right done there. Because Jesus then comes, Peter just gives up. Goes, where does he go back to? Goes back fishing. You can read this in John chapter 21. He goes back fishing because that's what fishermen do. He's going to go back and get the business going again. And the resurrected Christ comes to him on the shores of the lake, right, and calls out to him. Helps him with a great big catch, by the way, too. Right? Hey, you're going to have a good day in the fishing business today. Fill up those nets. And he calls out to Peter. Peter knows it's Jesus' voice. Peter jumps out of the boat in his full fishing clothes and swims to store, shore. That's Peter. How about that? That's the Peter I know. That's someone who says, oh, I'm all in. He's just all in with whatever he does. He's going to be passionate. But here's the shift that happens in Peter. I think the identity integrity moves from earth to heaven in John 21. Remember the dialogue? And Jesus is kind of drying off on the shore there. They have some breakfast together. And then Jesus says to him, hey, Peter, not about the fish. No fish. It's about the sheep. Fish, sheep. Leave the fish. Feed the sheep. No more fish, mate. Let's get about. And then Peter just reinstated, placed in this. And the whole book of Acts, Peter becomes like the leader to the point where St. Peter Cathedral today, 190 nations. I don't think the fishermen thought that was going to be the legacy, let me tell you. But do you see that? His identity shifted from earth to heaven. So then the book of Acts records a young man who's like, he's not working to gain the Father's approval. He's received the affirmation. He's received from Jesus. I know you. I love you. I see you. I'm for you. Now let's go. We got some stuff to get done in my name. Do you see that? But the early part was probably trying to like gain God's approval or God's way. So he just kind of like me, all mixed up in there. And maybe perhaps like you. So Peter's a good character study if you're in this space of identity, integrity, if some of this is resonating with you. Listen to how Tim Keller put it. When the work under the work has been satisfied by the Son, hear this, all that's left for us to do is serve the work we've been given by the Father. Man, do you feel the freedom in that? When the work beneath the work is done, you're just free then to just serve the work. You're not trying to extract out of it more than the Father intended. You give it your best and you bust your tail and you say at the end of a week, you feel the finish and you say, it's good to labor in your name for your glory. But it's kept in its good place and it hasn't migrated to the ultimate place where you try to extract out of it a sense of identity and value and worth that God never intended work to be. That would be the Bible definition for an idol. When something moves from the good to the ultimate and that can happen with work pretty easily. And so do you see the connection for identity, integrity to God and Mondays? This is how you can move into your work week with great freedom, 
of walking with Jesus in the fullness of his spirit into the chaos of all of your work and doing it even if the work from your perspective, you're not making any progress with the work. You're not looking for the work to define you or complete you or make value and worth about you. You have freedom. You know I'm loved by God. He sees me. He knows me. He's loved me. He's for me. And so I'm going to give you a little mantra to kind of take to the office, put this somewhere in your regular work startup morning routines. Here's what I put it in your notes. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what others say about me. I am a child of God. So you're going to repeat those after me. I'm going to say them each one time, and I want you to internalize those. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what others say about me. I am a child of God. That's your identity integrity. From that place, church, you put your hands to the plow of work and you work at it with all your heart, entering into the chaos to create and shape in the name of Jesus for the glory of God. And that work keeps its rightful place a good thing. Which brings us to why all of you wore your work clothes to church today. So, those of you going to help me with this segment of the service, come on up, get lined up over here. I had a burden a couple of months ago to wrap up this series with a time of commissioning. Here's what we're going to do. My desire and heart for the next few minutes is to commission all of you into full-time ministry. You're all commissioned into full-time ministry. You're no more commissioned in a full-time ministry than I am as a pastor or that Petula Myers is as a missionary. And what do I mean by commissioned in a full-time ministry? Flip over on the back side of your note sheet, and here's what I mean. As a disciple of Jesus, do you see that statement right there? And Mike's going to put it up on the screen for us. Here's what we have. As a disciple of Jesus, here's what it means to be commissioned. You're called. If you're here and you're in Christ, you are called. You're called by being in Jesus. I'm called to be a pastor. You're no less called by being a a doctor, an engineer, a fireman. You're called if you're in Jesus. We've established that. That's the theology of calling a few weeks ago. As a disciple of Jesus, I'm called to what? Create and shape in the midst of chaos. See that? Work wholeheartedly in the way of the Imago Dei. Offer gentle non-cooperation with evil. And then rest from the work in a six-in-one rhythm. Now, we're going to get into the rest part more. Julia's going to teach on Sabbath next week, so she'll kind of unpack that a little more. But those are the four tenets of what it means in just a moment for you to stand a representative from each of the 14 categories of vocations on your sheet are going to come before you. They're going to introduce themselves. They're all part of this body. They're going to introduce themselves, what they do, and then they're going to ask those of you who are in that category of work in a moment, they're going to ask you to stand, and we're all going to recognize, kind of cheer and applaud for each of you. And here's what I want you to receive in this moment. I want you to receive a sense of affirmation and commission from the Father, like the Father to the Son for your work. That's what I want you to see, that God has shaped you and called you and placed you where you are to be His disciple to do these four things right there. Amen? You with me in this? And so they're going to remain on stage, and then I hope it's a cool visual. We'll get someone, hey, someone center aisle here with a really good camera. Maybe you, Andrew, can you really get a good picture at the, like, we're going to have 14, 15 people all representing through what they're wearing all the different vocations that are in your categories of work. All right, you good? Tech crew, we're good up there. Follow on the screens, too, if you, those of you online at home, love for you to participate, too, right? So you stand when your segment is called as well. Okay, Debbie Head, come on up, get us started. Hello everyone, I'm Debbie Head. Our family has owned and operated 14 businesses in the past 48 years. We currently own Palomino Ballroom Banquet and Conference Center, Celebration Central Party Rental, Wild Willow Equestrian Center, uh, Copper Moon Entertainment, and Jessica Strickland Photography. Um, It's been a real blessing. And for those of you that are called to the world of business to shape and create, be it um, an accountant, an engineer, in real estate, small business owner, would you please stand? All right, let's clap for all of them. You may be seated. 
I am Tiffany Johnson, and I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Riley and have been there for the last 18 years. All of those who feel called to shape and create in the world of healthcare, please stand. This includes doctors, nurses, dentists, therapists, trainers, hygienists, researchers, those in pharma, everyone supporting everyone in healthcare. Please stand. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah Myers, and for the past four years, I've been a middle school and high school history teacher. Uh, for all of those of you who have been called to create and shape in the world of education, so from teaching to administration, coaching, support staff, would you please stand? All right. Education, coaching. Man. Hello, my name's Chris Simone. Um, I've owned Amore Pizzeria here in town for 19 years. So those who are called to shape in the service and hospitality industry, please stand with me. Anybody in hotels, boutiques, salons, if you provide a service or sell products to people, stand up and be recognized. Yeah, All right. Good morning, y'all. <laughs> my name is Hunter Smith, and my wife brought her vacuum cleaner and oven mitts to church this morning. <laughs> we represent traditional complementary roles in the home. <laughs> <laughs> and if that bothers you, leave Eric alone. <laughs> We are farmers here in Zionsville. We own Wonder Tree Farm. Our vision is to reconnect people and families to clean local food and agricultural experiences. If anyone here is in the world of agriculture at all, that could mean that you work at a big giant uh, sort of animal ph pharmaceutical place or any of these places that create um, Seeds and all of that, I'm just trying to give you the big gamut of <laughs> agriculture these days. It's not just some guy who has totally given up the cool factor. <laughs> um, <laughs> or if you just have like five acres and a flock of chickens. Anybody here from the top all the way down who feels called to steward, create, and shape the world of agriculture, please stand. Amen. Yeah. Go farmers. Good job, brother. <laughs> I'm Jason Hendricks. I've been a firefighter for 19 years. All of those of you who have been called to create and shape in the world of public safety, please stand. So military, police, fire, EMS, security of any kind. All right. <laughs> military, fire. I recognize you. Man. Thanks, Jason. All right. Come on. You should all see me, there's no problem. <laughs> My name is Jay Kellogg, I'm with Kittle Property Group. We are a real estate development, design, construction, and property management firm. So anybody that's involved with the architecture, engineering, any of the construction trades that service anything with construction or property management, please stand and be recognized. Yes. Yeah. You're at the end. You're at the very end. Yeah. We'll get Tim next. Sorry. It's okay. Hi, I'm Tim Swearens. I work as a journalist and communications consultant. If you're called to create and shape in the creative arts, in music, photography, digital media, communications, journalism, please stand. Man, all right. Let's go, Ella. Student world. Make sure to mention the middle schoolers, too. Yep. Hi, I'm Ella. I'm a senior at Carmel High School. So would all the students, middle school, high school, or college, who are called to create and shape in the classrooms, please stand. Come on, students. Let's go, students. Let's go, students. Up 
Fair Center, Age Center, on the road. Hi, good morning. Oh, We're Neil and Debbie Abney. I'll get them all the way to the All road. the way here. Yeah, here we go. we go. Hi, we're Neil and Debbie Abney, and I recently retired from the state of Indiana after 13 years. And uh, we're in the middle of a uh, transaction right now. We uh, uh, had left one church, and we came here to um, Eagle, and uh, we're just uh, getting ready to make the move to Arizona, and uh, kind of a big step at uh, we just love our church family here and uh, what they've taught us, and we're hoping that uh, what we learned here and uh, that we could take it to uh, the next level uh, out west. All of those that are finding themselves in a transition, whether it's changing jobs, careers, looking at a big move out of state, recently retired, would you please stand to be recognized? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jana Lange Bartles, and I'm a full-time homemaker and mom. Been home for 10 years. I have six children, ages one from one to 10. And uh, all of those who are called to create and shape in the caring of your home for children or volunteering as well, uh, will you please stand? Hi, I'm Chad Sears. I'm a pilot with Beck's Hybrid Seed Company. I've been there for about eight years. All those that are involved in creating and shaping in the transportation industry, please stand. That would be pilots, bus drivers. I don't know if you if you drive or you know relocate anything. Go ahead and stand up. Yeah, transportation. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Gottschall. I've been an attorney for 15 years. <laughs> Make sure no one threw anything at me. If anyone's been called in the legal or political space, so attorneys, paralegals, politicians, office staff, support staff, could you please stand and be recognized? You got it, buddy. You're back in cleanup. You're good. There you go. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's now my turn. <laughs> my name's Ethan Erstein. I'm an HR director for a giant uh, missionary organization called Crew. And so I help with uh, hiring and solving people problems. And uh, if you are someone representing that group of people that works in a parachurch organization, uh, please stand up and let us recognize you. All right, I'm going to let them get a photo. I'm getting out of the way here. They're going to get a picture of all of you guys, right? All right, one more round of applause representing. Now, wait, 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 wait. All right, I forgot. If you didn't get any of the categories before, we're going to collectively recognize you. We're going to call you the others, okay? You feel free to stand. If you didn't get recognized in any of the previous categories, we want to recognize you and your work. All right, we recognize you. We good? Did we get pictures? Andrew, Ben, we good? Okay. Can you hold that for me, brother? Appreciate it. All right. So what I'd like us to do, and Ryan, you can go ahead and start if you'd like. Um, I want to just take a moment, and I want to pray a prayer of commissioning. And they're going to assist me in this by remaining here and kind of helping lead this section. And I want to frame it around two verses. I want you to think about Ephesians 2.10. Today is about Ephesians 2.10. And Psalm 78, 72, Ephesians 2, 10 says this, we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. You're God's workmanship. He's prepared good works in advance for you to do. And part of your Ephesians 2, 10 purpose is represented right here in these different categories of vocations. And then as you put your hands to that plow in the spirit of Colossians 3, working at it with all your heart, the last verse in Psalm 78 says, and David was a leader and he led and shepherded the people of God with a heart of integrity and with hands of skill. And so that's the prayer of commissioning that I want to pray over all of you. 
is this sense of commissioning you into full-time ministry in the spirit of Ephesians 2.10. And as you kind of, in a moment, you're going to open up your hands and allow God just to say with the hands of skill, oh God, would you bless and give favor. That the way I got to go about my work would be honoring and reflecting of you. And so many times today we ask the question, God, where are you in this world? This world seems like such a mess or my workplace seems like such a mess. I hope today you look at this and go, here's where God is. Look, right here. The Lord has deployed you into that setting of chaos, into that darkness. Remember Genesis 1? It was formless and empty until God got involved. Well, there's a whole bunch of formless and empty stuff going on in this world. And it's his disciples filled with his spirit called by his name who enter in to that formless and empty. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to bring shape to the shapeless and you're going to fill the empty by the power of his spirit. That's what it means to be commissioned into full-time ministry in all the spaces from students in your classrooms to those who are retired into a new chapter of ministry into all the vocations in between. Okay, so would you stand please? As you stand, I'd just like you to, if you're comfortable, just kind of hold your hands out, palms up. You on the stage as well, please. And by doing so, it's just kind of a symbol of receiving. Because we're going to receive from the Lord. You receive your identity from Him. That you are His son. You are His daughter. He loves you. He's well pleased with you. Receive that right now. And then from that place of a secure identity in him, Jesus, we just ask now by the power of your spirit to bless the work of these hands that are turned and laid out before you now. In all the spheres, in all the places of vocation, in all the offices, in classrooms, in work settings, in all those places that these groups of people are deployed in, in Jesus' name now, would you help them to enter into their Ephesians 2.10 purpose, to walk and step with the good works you've created in advance for them to do, that you'd give favor to the work of their hands, that you'd bless them with a heart of integrity and with hands of skill, that you'd fill them with your spirit and empower them for the work you've set before them. That you would protect them, O oh God, and just plead the blood of Christ over each one who's commissioned now into full-time ministry. Protect them, keep them, watch over them, strengthen them. When we feel in our work that we're at the end of our rope, that you'll be there, that you'll be our strength, you'll be our portion, you'll be our cup. And so I pray you'd provide many, Lord, whose hands are turned up now are needing some provision in their work. Hear their cry for help and provide, O oh God some needing encouragement, some needing light in the darkness, some needing hope in the despair. Hear our cries now. And commission us now. Commission us to bring our worship from Sunday into these spheres of work. And that by doing so, people would see your life and your light radiating in this world. So take these hands, we offer them to you to create and shape in the name of Jesus, to the glory of the Father and all God's people said, amen. One more round of applause for those on the stage. You guys can head off. Thank you. You guys can be seated for a moment. Thanks again. We're going to wrap up with a final song here um, before some closing words and benediction, but... You know, I've asked all of those who are up here on the stage at the end of service, they're going to come up here at the front because I, I had a sense today as I was praying for today that some of what needs to happen today is some of you need to get networked together in different areas of work. You're, you're kind of doing the same kinds of things and I want you to connect to each other. So all of those folks who are on the stage, they're going to be up here at the front at the end of the service. And let me encourage you, if you're in their industries, would you come up and introduce yourself and just get connected a little more together? Or maybe you're in a space where you're super discouraged in what you're doing and you just need a word of encouragement. I think these folks would be good ones to talk to uh, just to remind you, hey, you're not crazy for approaching this the way Jesus would want you to approach it. We're going to receive our offering during this song as well. 
Thanks for all of you who continue to be super generous for us being able to help and move God's mission forward in this world. You know, this is how it works. Disciples of Jesus being deployed, it, it works by people giving gifts to steward to raise up children and students who eventually move and go into the workforce and represent his name. That's what the local church is about. This is what we're doing. And so if you want to give online, details are up here. There's some offering boxes in the back if you want to give your physical gifts that way. So team's going to lead us one final song and then we'll have a benediction. Eric. Yeah. What happened? Okay. You always said to be bold. Okay. All right. I put it on my heart. Okay. A friend of mine just texted me and said her son is in Riley. He has a tumor. They just okay. found it. And they put a shunt to drain the fluid. Mm. I would like to ask my brothers and sisters just for two minutes longer yeah. to pray for him. That's His great. name is Jojo. Jojo. Tiffany, can I have you come up here? Tiffany, can you come up here? How about we have our doctor at Riley like lead this yes. prayer for us? Can you grab the mic over there, Tiffany, from the floor and just stand right. Pam, will you stay right here? I'm going to have Tiffany stand right beside you. And what's the patient's name? His name is Jojo. Jojo. And he has a brain tumor. tumor on his brain. So, Tiffany, would you just lead us a prayer for Jojo and just ask the Lord to. So, Ben, she grabbed the mic here on the floor. She put it, push it up. There you go. There you go. You're good. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, today we've um, heard some unfortunate news. Jojo has had um, to visit the hospital, and we know that he's got a long road ahead of him, and his family has a long road ahead of them, and we want to know that you're there for them. We want them to know that you are there and give them strength to help them on this journey. Please. Use your spirit, Lord. Help them along this way. Amen. Amen. I have one more thing to say. This young woman has been introduced to Jesus here recently by a good friend of mine, and she's learning about Jesus. Mm. So I, today I'm going to text her and say that all my brothers and sisters in Christ prayed for her son today. Mm -hmm. So she will know that there is a Lord, That's right. and he is with us, and he does do miracles. And I thank you all mm -hmm. for doing this for me. Thank you, Eric. Let's go. Keep going. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Jesus, we know our 
that church put your hands together if you believe that he is the answer the world needs it. have a seat for a moment I want to draw your attention to a few things hey a great follow-up from this series is a class that Ted and Julia have put together it's called divine design they're going to start at April 24th on Sunday mornings at 8 30 you can go on the website eaglechurch.com slash events and learn more but they're going to talk about how God has wired and shaped you to carry out Ephesians 2.10 purposes in your sphere of work, as well as in other places of your life. I think it'll be a really helpful next step based on some of the stuff in this theology of work and calling. So sign up online and check out more info there. All right, Easter weekend, just a heads up, we're going to do two services on Easter Sunday. What time are the services? 9 and 11. So if you show up at 10, you're going to get there for the benediction at the first one. That's not going to count for Easter for you, okay? So... <laughs> Had a bunch of those folks last year doing that, and they just kind of, you know, two-minute dip in, and then you're out. No, that's not how it works. So 9 and 11, here's what I'm asking. We're asking for your help. There's a large percentage of you who would prefer 9. Understand, understand. Some of you have things you got to get rolling to. If you can come to 11, would you please come at 11? That's going to help balance out children's ministry numbers and some spacing in here. So if you can, come at 11. And uh, we're going to do the exact same service at 9 and 11 with the children's ministry as well as in here. And as you can imagine, two services, twice the amount of work, twice the amount of volunteers needed. So if you could jump in and help from hospitality to children's ministry to tech ministry, if you'd just be a pair of hands available for that weekend, you could worship one and serve in one, super helpful to us. Just send a text or an email, help at eaglechurch.com help at eaglechurch.com. Just send your name in there. We'll follow up with you and get you plugged in somewhere, but we could just use some more hands to help carry out Easter weekend. Good Friday, 7 o'clock Friday night, one service on Good Friday, 7 p.m. as you plan out your Easter weekend. Okay, one final thing. Many of you have been asking about uh, what can we do with the situation in Ukraine. We've got some new data. We've got um, a new setup on our website. So you help Ukraine, there's, it's here on the screen, so you can go to our homepage, eaglechurch.com. If you click that site, help Ukraine. We sent $10,000 recently, and Trent Thornton, who's leading in the Alliance International Ministries, he's given us some amazing updates about what God has done with your $10,000 worth of gifts. We've got people deployed in Alliance Ministries on the border between Poland and Ukraine, and they're there serving and deploying resources into the churches and church leaders. There's many pastors and ministries still placed in Ukraine carrying out their ministry in the midst of the war. So we've got people funneling goods and services into those national Ukrainian pastors. Could you imagine the scope of their work? Picture their Sunday morning service this morning. Can you imagine that? And they're gathering their people in Jesus' name, most of them in underground bomb shelters. And they're continuing to worship and serve and care for the needs of the sick and the refugee and that. So if you click Help Ukraine, the Alliance has set up an amazing kind of, I think, an arm of making sure the dollars get to the people who most need it to help. Use that link if you're wondering, hey, I'd like to do something a little more tangibly with this. That's where I would suggest and encourage, and that's what we as a church are doing. So grateful to be a part of the Alliance. Trent, thanks for helping keep us informed uh, with what's happening. He sent a really grateful text saying, hey, because of your dollars, a whole bunch of people got some help this week, and he was just wanting to say thank you to the Eagle family. So, all right, let's stand together. Those of you involved in the Children's Ministry Appreciation Lunch, you know who you are. You signed up earlier. Don't forget that lunch is today downtown. They just want to appreciate and thank you for all your service in Kids World. All right, I want to send you forth with a benediction from the baptism text where I want you to receive what Jesus received. Matthew 3, verse 17, a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. So may the father who sent the son, may he send you forth today, hearing clearly his voice, I love you, I know you, I see you, I'm for you, I'm with you. Now go in my name with a blessing on the work of your hands to create and shape and be his light in the midst of the darkness. Go in his name, amen.